Hello and welcome to Political Capital. I'm Harsha Subramaniam, standing in for Vivek Law. Over the course of the next month, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will hold one-on-one -on -one meetings with three of the most important economic and trading blocks in the world. Our team of reporters, Sunanda Jaisil and Gaurang Sinha, Anupriya Nair and Priyal Gulyani tell us who's, who he is meeting, why and when. I'll also be joined by Akshay Mathur and Neelam Dio of policy think tank Gateway House, who've been partnering with us to understand the business of foreign policy and what it means for India Inc. But Sunanda, you go first. Give us a timeline of the big meetings that Prime Minister Modi is scheduled to hold in the next one month. Well, Harsha, Prime Minister Modi will complete 100 days of being in office in October of this year. He's already had a series of meetings, uh, but three key meetings that you're watching out for before October. The starting next week, where he will be flying to Tokyo to meet with his counterpart Shinzo Abe. Trade and easing up of trade between Japan and India is likely to be on the agenda. Next, uh, we will uh, see uh, the Chinese Premier Li Jinping, who will come into Delhi. That's expected around mid-September. He's already met with him on the sidelines of the BRICS summit. Uh, where they've discussed for uh, trade and border issues. But this is the big one that we're watching for, Harsha. He will be me uh, going uh, around the end of September to the U.S. This was a will-he-won't-he -he meeting, and it's going to be the first meeting between President Barack Obama and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Harsha. All right. So all of that is going to happen in the month of September. Uh, Gorang is standing by to tell us about the first stop, Japan, a country where he already enjoys a strong relationship with Prime Minister Abe, uh, in his earlier stint as Chief Minister of Gujarat. But what's the, what's the agenda for this meeting? Why is Japan important? Goran. Well, yes, in the run-up to Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan, we could see some major announcements coming in with regards to roads, uh, railways, as well as the smart cities projects. Now, Japan has been a key investor as far as India's infrastructure growth projects and historically has been concerned. And we could see an expansion of that role with Prime, Minister's Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan. Now, uh, you know, uh, going into this visit, we are hearing from Finance Ministry sources that SEZ taxation will be a highlight issue in this visit. And, and it's extremely high as far as the Japanese agenda in this visit is concerned. Now, Japan will be asking for a rollback or a reduction as far as the rates of MAT and DDT in SECs is concerned. And this is something which the Japan International Cooperation Agency has also been asking for. Now, in the past, the Commerce Ministry has also written to the Department of Revenue uh, with regards to uh, you know asking for a reduction for the rates of DDT and MAT in SECs. And we could see perhaps further, a further push coming in from Japan on that. Now, in this visit, we could also perhaps see India's first uh, major uh, defense deal with Japan going through as well. And we could see some progress as far as the civil nuclear agreement uh, with Japan is concerned as well. So these, these are really some of the key highlights which we could expect as far as PM Modi's visit to Japan is concerned. Back to you. All right, that's Japan for you. Soon after the Japan visit, Prime Minister Modi will host the Chinese president in India. Uh, even in the best of times, India-China relations and trade have always been a sensitive issue. But Prime Minister Modi has had China in high regard after the trips that he's made as, as the Chief Minister of Gujarat. Anu is standing by to tell us what's the business between India and China and why it's significant. That's right, Harsha. In fact, like you just heard Sunanda say that the big meeting is going to be sometime in the third week of September. The dates are not announced yet, but preceding that meeting, a lot of hectic activity between India and China, starting in June itself, where Sushma Swaraj, external affairs minister, had met her Chinese counterpart in, on the sidelines of the ASEAN meeting in June. Um, Nirmala Sita Raman also, we believe, is expected to meet uh, the trade minister of China, and she will be traveling to Beijing as early as the first week of September. And the big talking point is going to be the India-China trade, which at this point, is tilting largely towards China's benefit. In fact, uh, the bilateral trade, uh, the last known figures of 2013, stood at $65 billion. In fact, trade has gone up nine uh, times in the last 10 years, where China has now replaced uh, the UAE and the US as the top trading partners for India. But this has largely been, as I mentioned, towards China's uh, favor as it's skewed towards imports. In fact, India's deficit towards China when it comes to the import is as high as uh, uh, $31 billion in 2013. In fact, Jan to April numbers as well in a Lok Sabha, rep uh, in a Lok Sabha reply, Nirmala Sitaraman has put in at $9 billion. That's the figure coming in already for this uh, fiscal year. Uh, so where is the worry really key and what is the big talking point? Uh, and India needs more access to China. That's been the big talking point for the Indian officials and they're 
they're going to approach that with the trade minister as well in the Beijing meeting and similarly with the Chinese president who will be arriving in India in uh, September. That's going to be the big talking point. Uh, India right now exports some petroleum products, gems and jewelry and some raw material as well to China. Whereas China exports to India much higher value goods when it comes to machinery, infrastructure largely, electrical equipment as well, which are all high value investments. And that is why there's a $35 billion deficit which is towards China at this point. India is seeking more access when it comes to pharma as well as industrial goods within China to boost the trade for India. Hold our thoughts. So we've spoken about uh, Japan, we've spoken about China. Finally, at the end of September, Prime Minister Modi will head to the United States, first for the United Nations General Assembly, then a meeting with President Barack Obama. Uh, Priyal, what's really lined up there? Well, the U.S. has already put an optimistic target of uh, increase in the bilateral trade to five-folds to about $500 billion in 10 years period, and that would uh, be uh, the target for which uh, the talks would really be going forward as far as the trades between the two countries are concerned. Uh, the, uh, uh, the visit of John Kerry, which was a precursor uh, to this uh, September visit, of course, uh, the Prime Minister pointed out uh, that the opportunities for partnership in trade, clean energy, skill development, agro-processing, and education and innovation is something that India would be looking at, but experts point out that the two key focus area would be uh, the defense trade, of course, with India being one of the largest exporters and, of course, uh, taken about 32,000, over 32,000 crores from the U.S. Uh, in terms of the defense equipment imported the same uh, in about last three years. This could be one area that could be a very critical in terms of some uh, trade ties coming in, and especially since, uh, the, uh, since India has opened up the FDI to about 100% in defense. Right. As, uh, the other area, of course, would be the energy security, where it would be looking at collaboration coal power solar and solar and wind uh, energy and of course a tie up as far as sh shale gas uh, lpg and renewable energy in fact india is hoping that as far as selling of lpg from us is concerned there could be consideration of it relaxing uh, the compulsory fta norms uh, which india does not have with the us uh, of course uh, apart from that the contentious issues as far as wto uh, as far as immigration bill and uh, the in uh, the uh, global farmers uh, in terms of attacking the uh, Indian intellectual property is something uh, that could also be touched upon or a key area as far as the concerns uh, that could come on the table in the India-US uh, uh, meet that would be scheduled between the, uh, between the uh, leaders. Priyal, uh, many thanks indeed for joining us with those perspectives. Very, very valid points there. But let's focus on the two Asian giants that we spoke about. Uh, joining me to talk about that on what's at stake with both China and Japan Akshay Mathur, Research Head and Geo Eco Fellow at Gateway House, Foreign Policy Think Tank. Uh, we're partnering with them in this exercise to understand the business of foreign policy. Akshay, thank you for joining in. Uh, let me start with China. You know, we, the last time conversation we had was when the BRICS Bank happened. Uh, how significant is this meeting between the leaders of the two nations? Uh, and will India-China relations, uh, will, it be, will it create a new framework? Well, we are trying to, Harsha, and mm. uh, as you pointed out, the business as foreign policy is really interesting. There can be two ways we can go about it. Either mm. we use business mm. to achieve our foreign policy goals, mm. or we use foreign policy to achieve our business goals. Mm. Either way, we have to work with China. Mm. Uh, in this case, uh, unlike Japan, mm. with China, India has not quite yet worked out mm. an operating model mm. uh, where we can seek their investments. Mm. The MOU to set up industrial parks is the one such first structured way in which we are trying to seek capital sure. from China. So, mm. uh, so that is only the first structured way, but otherwise we have not seen much movement. A free trade agreement, would that be uh, far-fetched? Very far-fetched. Mm. You know, we have, we have about $35 billion in deficit. Uh -huh. We are not a manufacturing hub. We are going to get overwhelmed with Chinese products if that were to happen. What, what, would, what do Indian businesses want? Would they want greater foothold into China? What's, what's you know, what's our requirement? There are a couple of things. Uh, first is, of course, Indian uh, companies have been fighting for greater access. Our pharma companies have been wanting more access. Mm. Some of our services companies have been wanting more access, which we have not yet had. Mm. Uh, our product manufacturers and importers have actually had a good time because they believe they like Chinese products, they've been importing them, and mm. we've been using them in our market. Mm. 
Another interesting development outside of products mm. is the financial space mm. because Chinese loans are now coming into India and mm. Reliance has taken a few loans mm. and it's not less. We've now reached close to, I think the cumulative loans are close to four to five billion dollars, not for Reliance, mm. but other Indian companies included. Sure. Uh, Chinese Exim Bank has given a loan to ICICI Bank so mm. that they can facilitate uh, imports from China. So mm. the financial space is very, very, very interesting. One, one aspect that keeps coming, Akshay, when you talk about China is infrastructure. Uh, does, I mean, would, would, China be interested in, in building infrastructure in India? Would is there an opportunity for Indian companies? China is interested, mm. but India is not. Why? Uh, uh, there are uh, they, we have quite not figured out how we can engage them mm. uh, uh, in a way in which uh, their labor mm. and management skills. Their management skills can be brought over, mm. their process uh, and engineering skills can be brought over, but not their labor. Sure. We have not quite figured out a way in which the contracts can be executed. Mm. Even though cumulatively we do about $60 billion worth of contracts to China mm. uh, you know, so far, but we've not quite worked out an operating model. Mm. Uh, what about areas like power and, 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 and energy? You know, we saw that natural gas agreement between Russia and China. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be an area of cooperation logically? Uh, that would be, mm. and in, there's one place in the world where we are cooperating, which is not talked about, and Hash, I'm so glad you mentioned it, which is Sudan. We mm. actually have a joint venture in mm. Sudan where mm. we are cooperating on energy. Sure. But we have not cooperated in, in one more area which is very obvious and very important, and mm. that is we both are large consumers of energy. Mm. And we have not cooperated either mm. in buying and purchasing energy together or creating a market for it sure. so far. Um, let, let me shift focus now to, to Japan. You know, uh, this has been an old favorite for Prime Minister Modi himself. Uh, there have been quite a quite a bit of uh, technology transfers, knowledge mm. sharing between the state of Gujarat and and Japan. Uh, do you see their engagement getting stronger? You know, there, there is a certain charisma and initiative that leaders hold. And in this case, if, if Prime Minister Modi has a has a uh, has a rapport mm. with the, with the Prime Minister of Japan, that's great for us. Mm. Uh, I've been told that apparently Prime Minister Modi is one of the three people Prime Minister Abe actually follows on Twitter. Sure. So I think that goes to say something. <laughs> that says uh, quite a bit. That says quite a bit in this age. Mm. But uh, having said that, you know, there are some interesting developments. Of mm. course, auto and pharma and some of these other sectors, mm. Japan has Japan, Japanese companies have been growing in India organically. Right. But there are some difficult spaces where Japan has moved in and mm. that is really really helpful to India mm. energy mm. which is nuclear as well as LNG uh, and defense you know J Japanese are willing to mm. sell their US 2 fighter aircraft mm. uh, actually it's an amphibious aircraft but sure. to India and of course infrastructure starting with Delhi Bombay industrial corridor mm. where they have a 26 percent stake so sure. these are difficult sectors and really really helpful for India to take these sectors forward so so if I understand you right from a Japanese company standpoint Areas like defense, uh, automobiles, well, even financial services, insurance, and so on, they see India as a market and they want to enter. Uh, what's in it for our companies? Uh, like, like I said, you know, there the, there are some difficult sectors, and uh, and uh, foreign companies usually do not want to partner or come into India in, in these difficult sectors. Now, nuclear is difficult. Our right. nuclear power corporation is now working with Hitachi or Westinghouse, sure. both of which are Japanese companies in a way, to create a deal. Now, it's a, it's a difficult space and not every, not too many foreign companies are interested in taking on that challenge. Sure. Uh, same thing with energy, to, to partner with LNG, we are partnering with Japanese companies now in Mozambique. Mm. Difficult sector again, and, mm. but really helpful for Indian companies, you know, because if we can do a joint venture with, which are, with our public sector companies, mm. uh, we can really go forward in many different directions. So sure. difficult sectors, and, and our companies are looking to partner with other, uh, other, con other companies in these spaces. Sure. Actually, you know, a, a colleague of mine, Willie Pesek, had written a piece about a month ago, uh, where he said two things. Uh, Shinzo Abe, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, and Narendra Modi, all three of them came on, came to power on the promise of reforms, mm. and he called it the ax Asia's axis of reforms. Mm. Uh, in some fashion, the maybe early, early days is yet, but you're seeing them stumbling. You're seeing them uh, not yet delivering on the promise of, of reforms. Is there a commonality in this? Uh, would they see seek cooperation because their their, their objectives are similar? Uh, the answer is yes. Mm. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is, of course, uh, you know, uh, the first, uh, when Pr Prime Minister Modi got elected, mm. China Daily's front page that day said uh, Modi to boost ties with India, a reform-minded Prime Minister. So, of course, this idea of reform carries a lot of weight and mm. it is being studied very closely in sure. other countries. Uh, whether whether Prime Minister Modi has stumbled or not, I think we need to give our, our government a little bit sure. more time. Sure. Uh, because, uh, because we also have to be cognizant that whether it's China, Japan mm. or India, we are now entering a space of difficult reforms, mm. you know, which has mass implications and right. not just, uh, not just. No, uh, I, I yeah. meant it in terms of abenomics. 
In terms of economics, uh, the, three, the three countries have their own set of problems. You know, sure. Prime Minister uh, Abe is now responsible for reviving a Japanese economy which has stalled for many decades. Right. And it's not just in his control. Right. Uh, it's a lot has to do with the world, uh, the macroeconomics, the global macroeconomics. Sure. Uh, I think Chinese in that sense have a little bit more head start just mm. because of their uh, vision and strategic attitude. Sure. Uh, the Reforms Council has done a lot of work, as you can see. And India, hopefully, we are seeing signs of it now with the Planning Commission going away and hopefully a new think tank coming in. Maybe there's, uh, there's going to be a lot more focus on reforms. And, you know, if Gujarat model or now the Rajasthan model or, <laughs> or an industrial park model, whatever model that is, I think we have to give them time to, to find. But, uh, but the short answer is yes. I think they'll be looking for synergies and that's why there is already a synergy between the three leaders. Aksha, many thanks Adit for joining us with your perspective. So we've spoken about China and Japan. Time for a break, but coming up next, we're going to turn attention to Prime Minister Modi's visit to the United States uh, late next month. Neelam Dio will join us on the other side. You're watching The Political Capital and we are discussing the business of foreign policy. Over 10 years after being denied a visa into the United States, Narendra Modi will head there next month as India's Prime Minister. India-US relations have cooled significantly since the heady days of the George Bush, Manmohan Singh nuclear deal. But the two countries and their companies still do a lot of business with each other. Joining me to discuss this, I'm joined by Neelam Dio, Director at Gateway House, a foreign policy think tank that we have partnered with to understand the business of foreign policy. Neelam, thank you so much for joining us in our studios. Uh, let me begin by asking you about the significance of this trip. Uh, we've had, there's, there's been a history to the Indo-US relations. There's been a history uh, with the existing prime minister as far as US is concerned. And there's also an immediate history of the Cobra Gadi episode. Uh, so how is it significant? I think it's really uh, quite important because uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, said from day one almost that uh, this relationship mm. is uh, much greater and transcends mm. any personal uh, disappointments and irritants. So as soon as the invite came from President Obama, mm. uh, he accepted. I, I think that's wise. Mm. I think it's also what uh, the leader of any country should do, mm. because after all, the United States remains the single most important country in the world. Now, there have been irritants, and uh, they will continue to be irritants. Sure. So whether they will be as um, you know scandalous as the Devyani Khobragade case, I doubt it. Mm. But between companies, between uh, uh, the government, there will continue to be irritants, and there will be lots of disagreements. Sure. I mean, our position on uh, Ukraine and Russia, for instance, is different. But that I think both countries, as democracies, are able to absorb mm. and uh, get ahead with the relationship. I'll get to the specifics of of this in just a bit, Nilam. But the, the big key question. Uh, does Washington see Modi as an ally or India as an ally? Uh, and will that be a consequence of this meeting? I think ally is too uh, specific <laughs> a word. India uh, does not mm. get allied with anybody. That's mm. our history and that's our been our foreign policy. Mm. So does uh, uh, Washington see us as a country they can do business with mm. politically and commercially? Sure. Yes. Mm. Uh, let me get to specifics. I mean, you know, we were, I, was I was talking to your colleague about energy security. Uh, there is a huge gap as far as India's energy requirements are concerned. Where is the opportunity for Indian companies uh, and India as a whole with the United States? Well, one is, of course, that Indian companies have invested mm. in the United States, whether it is Reliance in Shale, whether it is SR in uh, coal fields. Mm. Uh, the other is in the technologies. Mm. And there, I think we've had a lot of talk in the last few years. We haven't had so much uh, mm. progress. Mm. But that may well be because where are the Indian companies that are ready to buy the technologies, mm. which from the United States are always quite high priced, mm. which also come with uh, many caveats. Mm. Uh, the other is the big issue that's been going on between the governments is whether we can import uh, shale gas mm. from the United States. Now, the existing legislation in the U.S. is that they can only export gas mm. to their allies. Mm. Uh, so it would be nice maybe for the sake of gas to be an Which ally. Which is exactly why I asked the question yeah. of ally, you know. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, mm. there is also an effort underway mm. to make an exemption for India. Mm. You know, India, uh, because of our size, because of the stage of development we're mm. at, because of the kind of country we are, mm. uh, we always need exceptions, whether it is in the nuclear uh, area. Mm. And similarly here, mm. uh, I think there will come through with mm. an exemption. 
also for the reason that many other countries are ready to export gas. Canada, for instance, sure. is ready to export shale gas to us. So Indian com uh, American companies as well would like to see a, a change in their own legislation mm. to enable them to export to India. Defense. India has now uh, ex enhanced its foreign direct investment cap to 49%. Do you see American companies evincing interest? Is there an area of cooperation? Uh, there is, and we've had in the last uh, year or two, uh, especially under Ashton Carter, who was uh, in charge of this in the previous administration, they actually identified uh, about 10 mm. uh, projects where there could be co-production, co-development and co-production. Mm. Uh, we haven't made a lot of progress in that, but one of the spe specialized uh, missiles is where I think the mm. uh, American uh, establishment is making a big push. Mm. We should be interested, mm. whether in that specific project or in others. Mm. I think it's only uh, in that case that American companies will be able to come in. But I do want to point out that many of the companies, uh, many of the American companies, which are in the defense area, mm. are already in India in other areas. Sure. So GE or Raytheon or any of the others, they can come in easily because they already have a presence here. Two sectors that, you spoke about irritants, two sectors that have found problems uh, in the recent past. Pharma, uh, higher regulatory scrutiny, where ph Indian pharmaceutical companies have, uh, have sort of hit a wall. Uh, technology with, with the visa process. Do you see that uh, perhaps mitigating? I think to some extent, of course, it depends on the Indian companies. Mm. They really should meet higher standards, mm. not just for the sake of exports to the United States, but for the sake of all of us consumers mm. of those products. Ranbaxy, for instance, sure. has fallen short on in a number of its production facilities. It's, of course, now owned by a Japanese uh, mm. uh, company, but they really need to raise their uh, standards. Sure. Some of these are just problems that uh, any manufacturing faces in India. Shortages of water, for instance. Sure. You don't see the state, <coughs> this being raised as a state issue? I do see it being raised as a state issue because, mm. you know, uh, what the Americans do, as uh, Secretary of State Kerry, when he was here recently, mm. uh, he said, well, you know, we cannot make our companies, we mm. cannot tell them where to go and invest. Sure. But nevertheless, they push the interest of their companies sure. very hard. Mm. So, yes, I'm sure it will be raised as a state issue, and I think we should raise it on our part. Sure. Uh, because uh, not only is it that specific companies are mm. under scrutiny, but uh, as, a, as a nation, we are, uh, there is a report which will be presented in November. Sure. And uh, we need to make sure that that does not have any uh, adverse consequences for us. Technology? Technology, again, it depends. Defense technologies can only be exported with the concurrence of the state. No, no, I meant mm. the, the visa issue for the technology sector. Sorry, the, the mm -hmm. visa issue for uh, oh, our, the, IT, our companies. IT companies, yeah. uh, I think we are uh, on a losing uh, wicket. Mm. Uh, they are going ahead with their reform legislation. We should continue to press the issue as we have done for years now. Mm. Mm. Uh, but we haven't made any progress. And there is another area in this which mm. the Americans have not uh, responded at all, which mm. is the totalization agreements, sure. where our people continue to pay into their social security system, mm. but never draw the benefits of it. Sure. Prime Minister Modi has made it very clear that this is a significant uh, relationship as far as he's concerned and a, a cornerstone of his foreign policy. Uh, Ma'am, what can be or what are the areas that can trip relations? Um, <laughs> I think we are at the stage where we are going to pick up mm. and hopefully the trajectory will move uh, upwards. Red flags. Yeah, there are many red flags. There will continue to be disagreements on uh, Iran, for instance. Mm. On the other hand, if the Americans end up with an agreement on the, on the nuclear program of Iran, mm. it will open up a lot of areas for mm. us. Uh, there will be now this new area which the Americans have not criticized, but they have said that they hope India and Pakistan can resume mm. the, uh, the talks, etc. That's an irritant for us. In fact, uh, American support to Pakistan over the decades mm. and the arms supplies have enabled uh, Pakistan mm. to uh, be uh, aggressive with India, which under normal circumstances they should not be. So there will be many areas. Ukraine, our position on, uh, on that. Uh, there will continue to be irritants of that nature. But those are not deal breakers. Those mm, are mm. not such severe obstacles mm. that the relationship itself founders. Sure. Neelam Dio, many thanks indeed for joining us with your perspective. That's the view from Pleasure. Gateway House. So, uh, we're going to keep a close watch on foreign policy affairs of the government and how it affects business in the coming days. If you have been, thank you so much for watching.